Sila is play. So all individual manifestations are games, dances, symphonies, musical forms being put on by the whole show, and everyone is basically the whole show. So that's the fundamental feeling. Now, but nature, nature as the word is used in the Far East doesn't mean quite the same as the word nature in the West. In Chinese, nature, the word we translate nature, ziran, or in Japanese, shizen, is made up of two characters that first one means of itself, and the second one means so. What is so of itself? Of itself so, what happens, or as we say, what comes naturally? It's in that sense of our word nature, to be natural, to act in accordance with one's nature, not to strive things, not to force things, that they, they use the word natural. So, when your hair grows, it grows without your telling it to. And you don't have to force it to grow. So in the same way, when the color of your eyes, whether it's blue or brown or whatever, the eyes color themselves. And you don't tell them how to do it. When your bones grow a certain way, they do it all of themselves. So then, uh, it's fundamental to this idea of nature that the world has no boss. God, in, in much of the Western meaning of the word, means the controller, the boss of the world. And the model that we use for nature uh, ten, tends to be the model of the carpenter, or the potter, or the king. That just as the carpenter takes wood and makes a table out of it, or as the potter takes inert clay and with the intelligence of his hands evokes a form in it. That's our, that idea, you see, of the, the world as an artifact could prompt a child in our culture to say to its mother, uh, how was I made? And it seems very natural. So when it's explained that God made you, the child naturally goes on and says, but who made God? But uh, I don't think a Chinese child would ask that question at all. How was I made? Because the Chinese mind does not look at the world of nature as something manufactured, but rather grown. The character for coming into being in Chinese is based on a, a, a symbol of a growing plant. Now, growing and making are two different things. When you make something, you assemble parts. Or, you take a piece of wood and you carve it, working gradually from the outside inwards, cutting away until you've got the shape you want. But when you watch something grow, it isn't going like that. If you see, for example, a fast motion movie of a rose growing, you will see that the process goes from the inside to the outside. It is, as it were, something expanding from the center. And uh, so far from being an addition of parts, it all grows together, all moves all over itself at once. Because there is in Chinese philosophy no difference between the Tao, that is the word T-A-O in Japanese, Do. There is no difference between the way, the power of nature, and the, the things in nature. It isn't, you see, when uh, I stir up wind with this fan. It isn't simply that the wind obeys the fan. There wouldn't be a fan in my hand unless there were wind around. Unless there were air, no fan. So the air brings the fan into being as much as the fan brings the air into being. Lao Tzu, who wrote the, supposed to have written the Tao Te Ching, the fundamental book of the Taoist philosophy, he lived probably a little before 300 BC, although tradition makes him a contemporary of Confucius, who lived closer to 600. But he says in his book, the great Tao flows everywhere, to the left and to the right. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. 
And when merits are attained, it makes no claim to them. So the corollary of that is that if this is the way nature is run, not by government, but by, as it were, letting everything follow its course, then the skillful man or woman or the skillful ruler or the sage interferes as little as possible with the course of things. The notion is that life is most skillfully lived when one sails a boat rather than rowing it. Now you see, it's more intelligent to sail than to row. With oars, I have to drag, I use my muscles and my effort to drag myself along the water. But with a sail, I let the wind do the work for me. More skillful still when I learn to tack and let the wind blow me against the direction of the wind. Now that's the whole philosophy of the Tao. It's called in Chinese, Wu Wei. Wu, non, Wei, striving. In Japanese, Mui. E is Japanese for pronouncing the Chinese Wei. Mu is Chinese Wu. Mui, as distinct from Ui. Ui means to use effort, to go against the grain, to force things. Mui, not to go against the grain, to go with the grain. And so you will see around you in every direction examples of Mui of the intelligent handling of nature so as to go with it rather than against it. So it is said, in the winter, there's a tough pine tree which has a branch like this and muscles. And the snow piles up and piles up and this unyielding branch eventually has this huge weight of snow and it cracks. Whereas the willow tree has a springy, supple branch. And a little snow comes on it, and the branch just goes down, and the snow falls off, and whoops, the branch goes up again. So Lao Tzu said, man at his birth is supple and tender, but in death he is rigid and hard. Plants, when they are young, are soft and supple, but in death they are brittle and hard. So suppleness and tenderness are the characteristics of life, and rigidity and hardness the characteristics of death. first point I've been saying is what they mean by nature. That it is something that happens of itself, that it has no boss. And the second point is that it does not, in the sense that it doesn't have a boss, somebody giving orders and somebody obeying orders, that leads further to an entirely different conception of cause and effect. Cause and effect is based on giving orders. When you say, Something made this happen. It had to happen because of what happened before. Chinese doesn't think like that. His idea of causality is called, or it, I say the concept which does duty for our idea of causality, is called mutual arising. Stepping back again, we have these very, very basic principles then. The world, as nature, what happens of itself is looked upon as a living organism. And it doesn't have a boss because things are not behaving in response to something that pushes them around. They are just behaving. And it's all one big behavior. Only if you want to look at it from certain points of view, you can see it as if something else were making something happen. But you do that only because you divide the thing up. So now you say, final question, is then nature chaotic? Is there no law around here? There is not one single Chinese word that means the law of nature as we use it. The only word in Chinese that means law as we use it is a word, zi. And this word is a character which represents a cauldron with a knife beside it. 
And this goes back to the fact that in very ancient times, when a certain emperor made laws for the people, he had the laws etched on the sacrificial cauldrons, so that when the people brought the sacrifices, they would read what was written on the cauldrons. And so this word, z. But the sages, who were of a Taoist feeling at the time when this emperor lived, said, you shouldn't have done that, sir. Because the moment the people know what the law is, they develop a litigious spirit. And they'll say, well, now, did you mean this precisely? Did you mean that precisely? And we'll find a way of wangling around it. So they said that the nature of nature, Tao, is wutsa, which means lawless, but in that sense of law. But to say that nature is lawless is not to say that it's chaotic. And the Chinese word here for the order of nature is called in Japanese ri, Chinese li. Ri, it's a curious word. It originally meant the markings in jade, the grain in wood, or the fiber in muscle. Now, when you look at jade, you see it has this wonderful mottled markings in it. And you know somehow, and you can't explain why, those mottlings are not chaotic. When you look at the patterns of clouds, or the patterns of foam on the water, isn't it astounding? They never, never make an aesthetic mistake. Look at the way the stars are arranged. Why, they're not arranged. They're just like they seem to be scattered through the sky like spray. But would you ever criticize the stars for being in poor taste? <laughs> when you look at a mountain range, it's perfect. But somehow, this spontaneous, wiggly arrangement of nature is quite different from anything that we would call a mess. Look at an ashtray full of cigarette butts and screwed up bits of paper. Look at some modern painting where people have gone out of their way to create expensive messes. You see, uh, they're different. And this is the whole joke that we can't put our finger on what the difference is, although we jolly well know it. We can't define it. If we could define it, in other words, if we could define aesthetic beauty, it would cease to be interesting. In other words, if we could have a method which would automatically produce great artists, anybody could go to school and become a great artist. Their work would be the most boring kind of kitsch. But just because you don't know how it's done, that gives it an excitement. And so it is with this. There is no formula, that is to say, no tse, no rule, according to which all this happens. And yet it's not a mess. So this idea of ri, you can translate the word ri as organic pattern. And this ri is the word that they use for the order of nature instead of our idea of law, where the things are obeying something. If they are not obeying a governor in the sense of God, they are obeying principles, like a streetcar. Do you know that limerick? There was a young man who said, damn. Wait a moment. <laughs> For it certainly seems that I am a creature that moves by determinate, indeterminate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. <laughs> <laughs> so that idea of the iron rails along which the course of life goes is absent here. And that is why, basically, this accounts for Chinese and Japanese humanism. They work on the supposition that human nature, like all nature, is basically good. Uh, basically, but it's good is funny good. It consists in its good bad. It consists in the passions as much as the virtues. In Chinese, there's the word run. I don't know how it's pronounced in Japanese. I'll write it backwards. How do you pronounce that in Japanese? Jin. Uh, this means human-heartedness, humaneness. 
not in the sense of being humane in the sense of being kind necessarily, but of being human. So I say, oh, he's a great human being. Means that's the kind of person who's not a stuffed shirt, who is able to come off it, who is, can talk with you on a man-to-man -man basis, who recognizes along with you that he's a rascal too. And so people, men, uh, for example, when they each affectionately call a friend of theirs, hi, you old bastard, how are you getting on? This is a term of endearment. <laughs> because they know that he shares with them what I call the element of irreducible rascality. <laughs> that we all have. So then, if a person has this attitude, he's never going to be an overweening goody-goody. Confucius said, goody-goodies are the thieves of virtue. Because, you see, if I am right and you are wrong and we get into a fight, what I am out to is a crusader against the wrong and I'm going to obliterate you. Or I'm going to demand your unconditional surrender. But if I say, no, I'm not right and you're not wrong, but I happen to want to carry off your women. You know, I like this girl. You've got the most beautiful girls and I'm going to fight you for them. But if I do that, I'm going to be very careful not to kill the girls. In modern war, we don't care. The only people who are safe are in the Air Force. <laughs> they're way up there. You know, or else they've got subterranean caves they're in, you know? Women and children be damned. They can be frizzled with Hiroshima bomb. But you can sit in the plane and be safe. So this is inhumane because we are fighting ideologically instead of for practical things like food and possessions and being greedy. So that's why the Confucian would say he trusts human passions more than he trusts human virtues, righteousness, goodness, principles, and all that highfalutin abstractions. Let's get down to earth. Let's come up. So then, this is why the kind of man in whom the kind of nature, the kind of human nature in which trust is put because you see, look, if you are like the Christians and the Jews, and not so much the Jews, but mostly the Christians, who don't trust human nature, say it's fallen, it's evil, it's perverse, that puts you in a very funny position. Because if you say human nature is not to be trusted, you can't even trust the fact that you don't trust it. See where you land out? You land out in a hopeless mess. Now, it's true, human nature is not always trustworthy. But you must proceed on the gamble that is trustworthy most of the time. Or even 51% of the time. Because if you don't, what's your alternative? You have to have a police state. Everybody has to be watched and controlled, and then who's going to watch the police? A great deal of what we have done by way of technological development is based on the idea that man is at war with nature. And that in turn is based on the idea, which is a really a 19th century myth, that intelligence, values, love, humane feelings, etc., exist only within the borders of the human skin. And that outside those borders, the world is nothing but a howling waste of blind energy, rampant libido, and total stupidity. This, you see, is the extreme accentuation of the platonic Christian feeling of man as not belonging in this world, of being a spirit imprisoned in matter. And it's reflected in our popular phraseology, I came into this world. I face facts. I encounter reality. There's something that goes boom right against you like that. But all this is contrary to the facts. We didn't come into this world. We grew out of it in the same way that apples grow out of an apple tree. 
And if apples are symptomatic of an apple tree, and show that after all, this tree apples, when you find a world upon which human beings are growing, then this world is humane, because it humans. Only we seek to deny our mother and to renounce our origins, as if somehow we were lonely specimens in this world who don't really belong here and who are aliens in an environment of consisting mostly of rock and fire and mechanical electronic phenomena which has no interest in us whatsoever except uh, maybe a little bit in us as a whole, as a species. You've heard all these phrases, nature cares nothing for the individual but only for the species. Nature red in tooth and claw. Nature is dog eat dog, or as the Hindus call it, matsya nyaya, the law of the sharks. And so also the a very popular idea in the 19th century, running over into the common sense of the 20th, that we belong as human beings on some very small, unimportant speck of dust on the outer fringes of a very small galaxy in the middle of millions and millions of much more important galaxies. And all this thinking is pure mythology. Let me go in a little bit to the history of it because it's important for us as Westerners to know something about the history of the evolution of our own ideas that brought this state of mind about. We grew up as a culture in a very different idea where the universe seen as something in which the Earth was the center. And everything was arranged around us in the way that we, of course, as living organisms, naturally see the world. We see it from a center, and everything around us. And so this geocentricture of the world was, however, one in which every human being was fantastically important. And you were watched day in, day out, minute in, minute out, by your loving and judging Father in heaven. And you, because you have an eternal life, are infinitely important in the eyes of this God. But Western people got this uh, feeling that this became too embarrassing. You know how it was as a child when you were working in school and the teacher walked around behind your back and looked over while you were working, and you always felt put off. And so in exactly the same way, it's embarrassing to feel that your inmost thoughts and your every decision is constantly being watched by a critic, however beneficent and however loving that critic may be. That you are always under judgment. To put this to a person is to bug him totally. So, it was a great relief for the Western world when we could decide that there was no one watching us. Better a universe that is completely stupid than one that is too intelligent. And so it was necessary for our peace of mind and for our relief that during the 19th century particularly, we got rid of God. And on then that the universe surrounding us was supremely unintelligent and was indeed a universe in which we, as intelligent beings, were nothing more than an accident. But then, having discovered this to be so, we had to take every conceivable step and muster all possible energy to make this accident continue and to make it dominate the show. So the price which we paid for getting rid of God was rather terrible. It was the price of feeling ourselves to be uh, natural flukes in the middle of a cosmos quite other than ourselves, cold, alien, and utterly stupid, going along rather mechanically uh, on rather rigid laws, but heartless. Now, so, this attitude provoked in Western man a fury to beat nature into submission. And so we talk about 
war against nature. When we climb a mountain like Everest, we have conquered Everest. When we get our enormous phallic rockets and boom them out into space, we are conquering space. And all the symbols we use for our conquest of nature are hostile. Rockets, bulldozers, this whole attitude, you see, of dominating it and mastering it. Whereas a Chinese person might say, when you climb a high mountain, you conquer it. Well, why this unfriendly feeling? Aren't you glad the mountain could lift you up so high in the air so as to enjoy the view? So this technology that we have developed in the hands of people who feel hostile to nature is very dangerous. But the same technology in the hands of people who felt that they belong in this universe could be enormously creative. The important thing about this whole uh, philosophy of nature and of man's place in nature is that this Taoist and later Zen Buddhist and Shinto feeling about man's place in the world is today corroborated by the most advanced thinking in the biological and physical sciences. Now, I can't stress that too much. Science is primarily description, accurate description of what's happening, with the idea that if you describe what is happening accurately, your way of describing things will become a way of measuring things, and that this in turn will enable you to predict what is going to happen. And this will build you some measure of control over the world. Now, the people who are most expert in describing and who are most expert in predicting are the first people to recognize the limitations of what they're doing. First of all, consider what one has to do in science. In a very simple experiment in which you want to study a fluid in a test tube and describe what is in that fluid so accurately that you must isolate that fluid from what are called unmeasurable variables. I have a fluid in a test tube and I want to describe it accurately. But every time the temperature changes, my fluid changes. So I want to keep it free from changes of temperature. This already implies an air conditioning system. Also, I don't want my fluid to be jiggled because that may alter it. So I've got to protect it from trucks that go by the lab. And so I have to build a special bump-proof room where trucks won't jiggle it. Also, I have to be very careful that when I look at this fluid, I won't breathe on it and affect it in that way. And that the temperature of my body as I approach it won't alter it. And I suddenly discover that this fluid in a test tube is the most difficult thing to isolate in all the world because everything I do about it affects it. I cannot take that fluid in a test tube and take it out of the rest of the universe and so it is separate and all by itself. A scientist is the first to notice this. Furthermore, he knows not only that it is his bodily approach that alters things, he finally discovers in studying quantum theory that looking at things changes them. So when we study the behavior of electrons and all those subatomic particles, we find out that the means we use to observe them changes them. So that we, what, what we really want to know is, what are they doing when we're not looking at them? 
Does the light in the refrigerator really go out when you close the door? So what all that is telling us is you cannot stand aside as an independent observer of this world because you, the observer, are what you're observing. Now, how will you tell, how will you say what an ant is doing without describing, at the same time, the field or the environment in which the ant is doing it? You can't say that an ant is walking if all you can describe is that uh, this ant is just wiggling its legs. You have to describe the ground over which the ant is walking to describe walking. You have to set up directions, points of the compass. And so you soon discover that although you thought you were talking about an ant, what you're actually talking about is an ant environment. A total situation from which the ant is inseparable. So too, human behavior involves, first of all, the description of the social context in which human beings do things. You can't uh, describe the behavior of an individual except in the context of a society. You have to describe his language. Indeed, in making a description, I have to use language which I didn't invent. But language is a social product. Then beyond human society, there is the whole environment of the birds, the bees, and the flowers, the oceans, the air, and the stars. And our behavior is always in relation to that enormous environment. This gives us, at first, as Westerners, a sense of frustration because we say it sounds fatalistic. It sounds as if we were saying, you thought you were an independent organism. You're nothing of the kind. Your environment pushes you around. But that idea, simply, if, if we would express that idea, as a result of hearing what I've just said, it would mean that we didn't understand it. You read B.F. Skinner, the supreme behaviorist psychologist, and he describes all phenomena of nature in terms of man being pushed around. But let's suppose that we live in a world where things don't get pushed around and can't be pushed around. Supposing there's no puppet, Supposing there is no cause and no effect, that instead of things being pushed around, they are just happening the way they do happen, then you get an utterly different view. And this is the view with which we are dealing, lying behind this culture. As I said this morning, there is no boss. You, as a human being, are not going to push this world around. But equally, you are not going to be pushed around by it. It goes with you. The external world goes with you in just the same way as a back goes with a front. How would you know what you meant by yourself unless you knew what you meant by other? How would the sun be light if you didn't have eyes? How would vibrations in the air be noisy if you didn't have ears? How would rocks be hard if you didn't have soft skin? How would they be heavy if you didn't have muscles? So that the way you are constituted, the way your organism is formed, calls into being the phenomena of light and sound and weight and color and smell. There is a koan in Zen Buddhism what is the sound of one hand? There's a Chinese proverb that says, one hand does not make a clap. So if two hands clap, make the clap. What is the sound of one hand? You see? What a silly question. And yet everybody is trying to 
play a game in which one side will win. And there can be one hand clapping to get rid of the opposite. Light, get rid of darkness. Most of you, I am sure, here, on the whole, identify yourself with the nice people. In other words, uh, you live uh, fairly respectable lives, and you look down upon various other people who are not nice. And there are various kinds of not nice people. In Sausalito, where I live, they're called beatniks. There are people who wear beards and who live along the waterfront and who don't follow the ordinary marriage customs and who probably smoke marijuana instead of drinking alcohol because alcohol is the drug for nice people. <laughs> now, what the nice people don't realize is that they need the nasty people. Think of all the conversation at dinner table that you would miss if you didn't have the nasty people to talk about. Who, how would you know who you were unless you could compare yourselves with those who are on the out? How do those in the church who are saved know who they are unless they have the damn? Why, St. Thomas Aquinas let it out of the bag and said that in heaven the saints would look over the battlements of heaven and enjoy the just sufferings of the souls in hell. Jolly, won't it be to watch your sister squirming down there while you're in bliss? But uh, that was letting the cat out of the bag because the in group can't exist without the out group. Now, in my community in Sausalito, where the out group is sort of the they in their turn know that they are the real in group. And that up on the hill, those squares, who are so dumb that they waste all their days earning money by dull work to buy pseudo riches such as Cadillacs and uh, houses with mowed lawns and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, which they despise. Uh, they feel very, very much collective ego strength by being able to talk against the squares because the outgroup makes itself the in-group by putting the in-group in the position of an out-group. But both need the other one. Well, this is the meaning of saying, love your enemies and pray for them that despitefully use you. Because you need them. <laughs> you don't know who you are without the contrast. So, Love your competitors and pray for them that undercut your prices. <laughs> you go together. You have a symbiotic relationship, even though it be formally described as a conflict of interest. Now, to see that kind of thing is the essence of this philosophy of nature. It goes together with the idea of the yang and the yin that we don't know what the yang is, the positive, the bright side, unless we at the same time know what the yin is, which is the dark side. These things define each other mutually. Well now, if I say it in words, you can probably follow my meaning and realize that all this is very true from a theoretical point of view.